Coming up next on Futures in Biotech, we're going to talk about delaying the inevitable. Simon? We're going to be talking to Dr. Brian Kennedy, CEO and President of the Buck Institute for Age Research, about what's going on in aging research at the moment. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Futures in Biotech is provided by Cashfly at cashfly.com. This is Futures in Biotech, episode 73, the new science of aging. This episode of Futures in Biotech is brought to you by Kaleidograph, a thoughtfully designed graphing and data analysis application for research scientists, as well as those in business and engineering fields. Try Kaleidograph for 45 days risk-free and receive a 20% discount if you purchase Kaleidograph within the next 60 days. Visit www.synergy.com forward slash podcast.htm for more details. And by MailRoot. MailRoot is a secure hosted email filtering service that you can have up and running in minutes. There's no hardware or software to install. Just sign up, change your MX record, and you're protected. Twit listeners get a 10% discount for life. Sign up today for a 15-day free trial at mailroot.info. I believe that biotech is the next frontier. Probably the greatest intellectual revolution that's ever taken place uh, in man's history. DNA is the code for life. We're actually beginning to understand how life works, which I think is something that's mind-blowing in and of itself. There was uh, going to be a genetic component to aging. How long was there the AD extension? About 30, 40 percent for humans. That would equate to something like 20 to 30 years. How close are we to actually having a therapy? Ballpark, 10 years. It's potentially one of the things that are rocking the world the same way that uh, people said, oh, the sun is the center of the universe, so this and that and everything. And now here's somebody who can come out and say, hey, look, here's how we compare it to our closest evolutionary relative. Yeah, so, you know, this is, that your experiment was a historical experiment. There's no question. It was, it was, it was one of those pivotal um, data points uh, in the field. Perhaps you could give us a little brief uh, summary of, or, or, you know, describe a little bit of what it was, what, how you guys came across, how the experiment came about and some of the details of the experiment. Now, people can tune back in to uh, uh, Dr. Grantee's version of it from, uh, that he explained four years ago. Um, but, you know, this, the, sh- the purpose of the show is first-hand account. So it'd be really great to get you. I mean, you're the one on the bench, right? You're the one. Yeah. yeah. Take and it also, so uh, how did it... Go ahead. I'll tell you, yeah. Uh, Nick Ostriaco was another graduate student who started the project with me, and it's fun to talk about him at some point, or you, you should talk to him because he's gone on after getting his PhD to become a priest, but uh, that's another story. Oh, wow. uh, oh, yeah. well, that's okay. But when we started in the lab, you know, we thought, what can we do that was different with yeast cells? Lenny had just gotten tenure at MIT and wanted to go out in a different area of research, and uh, we both wanted to try something out there, and we thought about aging. And uh, there was a little bit of work done on it by Michael Jasvinsky's lab, but it really was unstudied. And and so we had these single cells and you could just ask, how many times do they divide? Because they divide and they produce a bud. And every time you get that, that bud produced, you can go out with a needle and remove it and just count how many times that one cell or mother cell can divide. And it does it uh, 25 times or so and stops. And so then we started thinking about how can we find mutations in genes that would make the cell divide a lot more times. And that started this uh, long project that it's really a, a microcosm of how science works, in my opinion. You're asking an interesting question, and then uh, the results take you in some surprising places, and you're opportunistic about what, 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 the, what comes your way. And uh, at the end of the day, you end up with a discovery that uh, turned out to be important. And, uh, and that, that led to the idea that sirtuins were affecting aging. And it was a fun time because every time we did an experiment, we had to make up our own protocol and figure out how to do it. And it was a very creative creative period and uh, Lenny and Nick were, were great to work with during that era. Now, how did you, what was the assay exactly? It, so you've got these yeast, you didn't use a needle and pick off and keep 
looking for yeah. you mutate yeast and then you look for yeast that could do it longer because that seems like it would take forever. <laughs> yeah, although although well, that's what we've done more recently. Uh, I can tell you about that in a minute. But what we noticed at that point, well, it was an accident essentially. Uh, we had some uh, yeast strains that we had already done the lifespan analysis on, and so we had four strains that had different lifespans. The mothers divided either just a few times or uh, an average number of times, or more uh, more than average or really long number of times. Uh, and we took those strains and we uh, got uninterested in them and put them in the refrigerator. And then about th <laughs> three months later, we got, well, wait a minute, we want to do another experiment with those strains. And when we got them back mm -hmm. out, we realized that they weren't all, they had different viabilities. And so the, the longest lived strain was still happy after sitting three months in the refrigerator and the shortest lived strain was pretty much dead. And so we had this correlation between survival under cold temperatures and lifespan. And so then we could take advantage of that and then do mutants, um, just mutagenize the yeast, mutate a bunch of different genes and use ask for EMS strains. Or what? Or uh, EMS, use the EMS, yeah. And, okay, for those uh, listeners, by the way, sorry to interrupt because this is a really fun geek uh, uh, thing yeah. is that um, in Blade Runner, uh, one of the Blade Runners <laughs> asks uh, the, the father of all, godfather of, of the Blade Runners, uh, did you try EMS mutagenesis? Well, this is the time when we did. <laughs> well, we did. And, okay. uh, <laughs> did you use EMS mutagenesis? Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and so we, we put them in the cold. Well, we did something similar to putting them in the cold and look for the strains that stayed alive a long time and then tested their lifespan and they were long lived. And so that was our, our route to getting uh, 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 longevity mutants. And then we uh, a lot of the rest of the studies were just characterizing what we had and figuring out that one of those mutants was in the uh, SIR2 complex and helped SIR2 relocate to another uh, region of the nucleus where it was affecting aging. Um, and then, uh, so that was really exciting and you know, it's fun to just watch how that, 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 that how things have developed since that very simple discovery. Uh, there are over a thousand papers on SIR2 and aging now, and we've gotten back into it a little bit, but it's not really the center of what my lab does anymore. But so, but this spawned uh, some literally some uh, some some serious craziness. Some, and I, I mean it in, in the most respectful way here. Uh, so I mean, it's just almost unbelievable, right? That your discovery on the SIR2 wins. Uh, the, what what happened next? The sirtuin. Um, uh, who took on the project to see if they could activate the sirtuins? Well, so uh, two other people in Lenny's lab. So I went off to do a postdoc on cancer and uh, was out of aging for a few years. And two other uh, people in Lenny's lab really took it over. A number of people worked on it, but the, uh, Matt Caberline, who's at the University of Washington in Seattle, he uh, showed that if you have extra SIR2 activity, you just put an extra copy of this gene in, that yeast cells live longer. And that was a big discovery because that set the stage for doing similar experiments in, in other animals. And then uh, his work and also David Sinclair's work helped to define a, a mechanism by which SIR2 was... Uh, uh, affecting aging in yeast. And so that was an important discovery as well. David's at Harvard Medical School. Um, and and so once we knew that uh, the, they knew that overexpressing SIR2 extended lifespan, then Heidi Tizenbaum did that experiment in worms and showed that if you have an extra copy, it extends lifespan. And and uh, it was done in flies by Steve Helfand. And, and there are a lot of studies going on in mice right now doing very similar things. So um, that was one of the key discoveries, showing how you could just have a little bit more of this enzyme and it would extend the lifespan of yeast because it set the stage for doing these studies and and, and higher eukaryotes. So, Brian, how, how, how generalizable do you think this is in terms of the sirtuins are a, a family and there yeah. are many, many different pathways. And, and you know, we're getting these, these, these fairly robust increases in lifespan in multiple different species. But that's just, just one set of pathways. Do you think this is generalizable or is the, is the sirtuins the only way to do it or is this just one little corner of the aging universe? I, I think it's a modest part of the aging universe. Uh, and, um, and we, we actually, when I started my lab at the University of Washington in, in 2001, um, you know, what Linny had done is they found SIR2 and then they left yeast and they just went to study SIR2 and other systems. And what I thought is, well, if yeast was good enough to find one aging gene, we could probably find 
a lot more. And so this is where we did this brute force approach where we um, just got a bunch of microscopes and there's 5,000 yeast strains that are now available that each have lack one non-essential gene in yeast. So you, so you have a collection of strains that each missing one gene. And then we did uh, lifespan analysis by pulling the daughter cell off the mother for eat all 5,000 of those strains. Uh, we're still doing a lot of this now. And, <laughs> We've removed, wow. I think, six six million daughter cells manually by, by the, with a needle in my lab in the last several years. So it's a it's a, you know, you might not call it elegant, but it's effective. <laughs> so time uh, for automation, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I it would it would be nice, and people are working on that. But so then when we did that, we realized that there are 90 different genes that when you knock them out, they make the mother cells divide more times. So there are a lot more aging genes than we thought. And, and then we had to figure out, well, which ones do we want to study? And it occurred to us that we, what we really care about is human aging. And so uh, a number of labs uh, at various institutions had done screens, similar screens in worms, to look for worms that when you reduce the expression of a gene, live longer. And so we could compare our list to the worm list and find the conserved genes. And our bet was that if something extended lifespan in worms and in yeast, then it was likely to work in mice as well. And and we identified a few pathways, but the central one is really this pathway called the TOR pathway, um, which I can talk about in, in, in more detail. And what we've done in my lab now is now that we know which genes to study, we go back to yeast and sometimes worms to study them, but we're also going forward and we've made We've knocked these genes out in mice, and we've started to do longevity assays there. So I think there's going to be a number of conserved pathways that affect uh, that you can study in yeast and worms and flies that turn out to affect mouse and probably human aging. Um, and it's about figuring out how those pathways work and where we can intervene with with drugs to to slow the aging process and extend health span. I think that's the the challenge right now. So Do you Brian, think it was you, premature? Oh, uh, sorry, I'm going to ask one quick question. Then I think we have to go to a quick break. Um, yeah. Do you think it was premature for uh, uh, you know, Sirtuis was formed uh, based on the Sirtuin discovery, and the activators for the Sirtuin, which uh, uh, seem to extend in uh, lifespan in the in the animal models. Do you think it was premature for GlaxoSmithKline to buy them for seven hundred million dollars? I mean, this is the this is what the the implications are that this is maybe the next dot com. This is the Let's say let's extend human lifespan, and it's as you said with all these new candidates that you've discovered and that uh, other labs have discovered. Maybe it was premature for GlaxoSmithKline to go all out, or is it just an an indication of what's more to more to come? I think it's an indication of, of more to come. I, you know, it's it it's still the jury's still out on on Sertris and and uh, and GSK's purchase of Sertris. I think it opened a lot of eyes that there was so much money spent in buying that company, and seven hundred million dollars is a big is a, is a big price tag. Um, but I think that the, the broader question is what Sertris is trying to do is is the right idea is you know take take an approach that um, you have this slow aging and then develop compounds around that and test it for age related diseases like diabetes or cancer um, that's more or less what uh, a lot of aging researchers are trying to do in one way or another and the question is going to be which pathway is the is are the conserved pathways and also you know what are the side effects that you might get if you intervene in those pathways and i think the jury's still out on 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 the uh, uh activators of sirtuins uh, there's a lot of controversy around that i've been at the center of some of it and i can talk <laughs> about that but uh um I think the, the, the broader idea is that their idea is right, and the question is, what's the right target? And I'm, I'm not sure whether they have that or not, but it, well, it, we don't You've know yet. You've got more targets, and let's, let's, after the break, talk about some of the other strategies beyond the sirtuins. So, uh, by yeah. the way, if there's any venture capitalists listening, <laughs> keep your eyes open, because this is going to be a huge one. This is going to be huge. So... Um, I'd like to take a minute to thank Kaleidograph for sponsoring this episode of Futures in Biotech. Uh, Kaleidograph is a thoughtfully designed graphing and data analysis application for research scientists, business professionals, and engineers. It produces publication quality graphs and easily converts the most complex data into a functional display. Statistics, linear and nonlinear curve fitting, and the ability to produce precise graphic visualization of data all make Kaleidograph powerful and flexible. 
Since 1988, Kaleidograph has been an easy-to-learn graphing and analysis program with surprisingly affordable price. Try Kaleidograph for 45 days risk-free and purchase Kaleidograph within the next 60 days and receive 20% discount if purchased. So um, visit www.synergy.com forward slash podcast dot htm for details. That's synergy, www.synergy.com forward slash podcast dot htm for, for more details. By the way... Um, you know, we, we interviewed um, Mike Vuselic, and we're going to be replaying that episode uh, on December 31st. He was the uh, systems engineer in charge of the command module for the 24 men that went to the moon. So he designed the spaceship, and he did it with a slide ruler. <laughs> well, this, right now, what we're talking about, biotechnology, is the our moon mission. It's the moon mission of our generation, I think. And uh, our slide ruler, in part, at least mine is Kaleidograph. I use it every day. It's part of our uh, data analysis workflow, and it produces great graphs. So I encourage you to go give it a try. It's risk-free for 45 days. So download it, try it. If you like it, you can buy it. If not, well, you're, you're, you've at least tried it. And uh, your, your math experience will be, uh, you'll breathe easier when doing math when using Kaleidograph. I certainly do. Um, Excel's not the way to go. <laughs> it's so not the way to go. Um, do you use, by any chance, use Kaleidograph, uh, Brian or uh, Simon? No, uh, I, I don't. <laughs> Sorry, I don't. I don't, but I'm going to have to try it now. <laughs> well, it's more of a biochemistry thing. You know, if, if you're doing cell uh, kinetic assays or biochemical assays, you want to do like a, a curve fit. Um, it's really, really tight on the curve fit and it produces error bars and all that and uh, bar charts and everything. It's the error bars. It's all about the error bars for me. And if you can't make an error bar, it ain't science. It's just... <laughs> <laughs> Sounds good to me. Can't... Yeah. Okay, so let's get back to the, uh, let's get back to the science here. And um, you were talking about some of the other uh, angles. And Simon, do you think this, this is a good way to go? Uh, talk about some of the other pathways that, uh, where we might uncover uh, the secrets of life. <laughs> <laughs> sure. I mean, one thing I think it's worth worth at least spending a little bit of time on is is why 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 are we interested in this? I mean, of course, you've got the science fiction aspect to this, uh, and the extension of human lifespan, which, as Brian mentioned, has been sort of uh, fantasized about for thousands of years. But why, in particular, are we interested in doing this now? Uh, and 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 what is there a pressing need to do even more of it at a at a high level, and and that's something I, I know Brian spends a lot of his time thinking about is how to uh, encourage people to think about about this as a as a really key problem for human health. It's not just everyone wants to live longer and have fun and play on the tennis courts uh, longer in life. It's it's there's a there's a real important. Um, series of, of uh, uh, demographic reasons behind this research, which, which are really, really uh, critical for, the, for really the survival of society. Uh, Brian, you want to chip in on that? Sure. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a, a global issue that we're facing right now is that we're at a point in our history where there are more uh, older people in the population than ever before. And the numbers are, are staggering. You know, the, the, the U.S. is actually not one of the longest lived countries. Uh, uh, the, the two longest lived countries in the world are Japan and Korea, where people live into their mid 80s on average. Uh, and the, with a low birth rate and a long lifespan, what's happened in those countries is that you're going to have in the near future 40 percent of the population over the age of 65. So it's not just a quality of life issue to try to make people healthier at that age. It's also an economic issue because an economy that's skewed in that way is going gonna, is gonna to crash if all of the uh, people over 65 are drawing from health care and not working and contributing to the society. Uh, so... Uh, and it's not just Japan and Korea. This is uh, a big problem in the United States, of course, all over Europe. It's a big problem in China. Uh, the average lifespan is almost doubled in China, 1.3 billion people now. And the people that live in the cities are, are living in their 70s and up to 80 years of age. And then with the one-child policy, they have a, 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 a dramatically skewed ratio of older people to younger people that's going to happen in the near future. And I think it's even beyond that. A lot of countries have have made up for this changing demographic by immigration. People coming in from uh, other countries to for, because they have opportunity to work and 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 live in a, a different society. 
But even in these uh, what you might call third world countries, the average lifespan is going up dramatically. And in, in Indonesia, uh, in in 30 years, they're going to have about 25 percent of the population over the age of 65. So it's it's not just about a few people wanting to live longer. There's really a mandate to try to figure out a way to make people healthier later in their lifespan. And uh, so I think wow. that. That's one of the reasons that I came on board here is that you know I care about aging and and uh, I really want to try to get this message out that it's not just a few people that that are that are unhappy with living to 80 years of age. There's a an economic and and a issue and a, and an ethical issue to really go out there and try to see what we can do uh, to solve this problem or at least never, slow it down. I never thought of the the social implications of the increased age or increased lifespan. As, as uh, you know, thinking about this, not only do you want to live them till if they're going to live to 80, might as well be extremely healthy and youthful so that they can go out and make a significant contribution to society or else society will collapse, I suppose. Never, <laughs> I never thought about that. Uh, yeah, you're, is that you're the starting point? to see. Is that real, the, the, the take? Yeah, that's exactly right. Governments are concerned about this. There was just a policy statement released jointly by China, India, Japan, and Indonesia to this effect. And and uh, uh, what do we do? And and but the problem is a lot of these uh, governments are not yet thinking about that that's that it's possible to intervene and affect lifespan. And uh, this is one of the reasons that I set up a lab in uh, China about a year ago um, before I came to the bug, because uh, we want to try to. You know, start doing research over there as well on aging and get the message out that, wow, there's really an opportunity here to use medical research to start to solve this problem. And and I think that, you know, we can intervene now with a drug. Um, and this is work that's been done by a number of labs across the country, not here at the Buck. Uh, but you can, there's now a drug that you can give mice at 20 months of age. So that's the equivalent of about a 65-year-old human. And when you do it, those mice live 15% longer. Um, so this isn't fantasy. I mean, you can do it in all of the these invertebrate models I told you about, like yeast and worms and flies, but you can now uh, give drugs to mice and have them live longer. So, um, and, and they're starting... And they're healthier. They're resistant to... They have later onset of all the age-related diseases. And this drug is actually... Uh, it's called uh, uh, rapamycin. It's clinically approved already. It's used in cancer and atherosclerosis. So it's already used to treat some of the diseases of aging. Uh, now, I don't want to get people too excited about it at this point. There's, we still need to do more research. Uh, don't go out and beg your doctor for this uh, because there may be some side effects as well, and that has to be uh, studied. But I think the point I want to make is if you look at the sirtuin activators and if you look at rapamycin, we're, the aging research is starting to produce potential compounds that can actually affect health span in the human population. And I don't know if either of those two are right. They might be. I just don't know. But if that number two could be expanded to 15 or 20, then I'm starting, I'll bet you at that point, some of those things will be have efficacy in humans. And so I think the research is really exciting right now. It's producing potential candidate compounds that can actually um, change health span as we know it. So if we're going to, by the way, if Leo, if you're listening, that gives you 15 years before we, the <laughs> drug has to be ready for you to uh, be podcasting to the ripe old age of, say, the average lifespan is 80 <laughs> to a good 97 years old, right? So we've got a lot more podcasting ahead of us. <laughs> and, and, and for the average listener of, of, of the twit, I suppose the twit demographic is probably on average 32 to 35, so spanning to from 50, 18 to 50. Um, mm -hmm. For the most part, the bell curve. Uh, so that gives us plenty of time before these drugs uh, come out. Are they going to be available to everyone? How do you how do you go ahead with this and make it only available to, by prescription to those people with early onset age related diseases? Well, uh, this is a, a major issue because the FDA doesn't recognize aging as a disease, and so you can the standard route by which you t go through phase one and phase two and phase three trials. Uh, even if you had the patients to do an aging trial, uh, it, it, there's, aging is not a disease as the government recognizes it. So you can't get something approved for that. And that's why companies like Sertris are saying, well, let's take these drugs and get them approved for diseases of aging, like uh, diabetes or 
uh, Alzheimer's disease or or um, can forms of cancer. And then hopefully once we do that, there'll be a recognition of why they work and uh, either off label or it may change how our policy is toward aging. Aren't those just sort of like biomarkers of life that if you delay diabetes, age related diabetes or cancer, that uh, it's it's a way to get to your data quicker that these are successful compounds that relate to aging. Yeah, does, although does that make sense? You know, as a faster yeah. way, if people are dying, you save them and, and move them ahead, and you take people that are dying faster and you prevent their death, then you're gonna get your answer quicker. Yeah, although I think it's kind of a a, a slightly different approach. I mean, the classic approach to medicine has been um, wait till somebody gets sick and then uh, try to treat them. And to me, that's a lot harder than, than the approach we're taking, which is let's look for things that keep you healthy or longer so you don't get the disease in the first place. I mean, take a disease um, like Alzheimer's or Parkinson's disease. Once those neurons die, you've got a bigger problem on your hands. If you can delay the onset of it in the first place, I think that that's a, a novel and a highly promising approach. And really, I think what we're talking about is preventative uh, medicine, which is something this country doesn't do very well, but uh, it should look to because if you can prevent the disease, you're still healthy. Your health span is still going. If you wait till somebody comes in with late stage cancer, even if you're effective in treating them with chemotherapy and radiation and surgery, the quality of their life isn't as high. And so I think it's time to start looking at it from this route. And of course, you know, this gets back to something Simon can comment on better than I. There, there are behavioral interventions that I think are, are very likely to be good for health span and lifespan already. And, uh, you know, there are kinds of things that your mother told you, you know, exercise, eat right. Uh, uh, and, and, and I'm staying, I'm being very simplistic about this, and Simon can give you more detail. But um, there's stuff well, you can do. Actually, right I'd now. like to, Brian, I'd like to. Uh, Actually, bring it back to, to you mentioned age-related disease. I mean, we can we can get into the behavioral stuff in a bit, but the the, the emphasis on on research from a funding perspective has traditionally been on on these age-related disease, which consume the vast majority of the the NIH's budget. Yeah. And you want to you want to talk a little bit about that disparity, which we know is uh, an ongoing situation. Yeah, so so first the first problem is that the NIH budget hasn't been going up with inflation the last several years and so uh, a lot of labs around the country are really struggling to get funds. So that's that's a problem for everybody. But aging itself is very underfunded in my opinion. I I'm a chair of a study section that reviews a lot of the aging grants and you see uh, a lot of good grants come in uh, for aging research, and, and just very few of them can actually get the money to do the research. And the reason is that the, the amount of money that gets spent on cancer research or heart disease is almost tenfold what gets spent on the basic biology of aging. And yet what we're saying is, and I think a lot of people agree now, is that aging is one of the causes of these diseases. So really when you're doing aging research, you're doing disease research. The difference is that you might be targeting a whole series of different diseases diseases at the same time by looking at the common causal factor as opposed to looking at a specific disease after, you know, and developing therapies after uh, people get uh, sick. So um, the problem is that the, the, the NIH doesn't change quickly and so a lot of the money uh, that's being spent is, is being spent on things like cancer and, and, and heart disease, which is fine, but the amount that's being spent on aging is really, really small right now. So do you think that's a... I just was going to say, do you think that's a problem of uh, of of trying to educate the general public about the 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 reality of addressing um, what what could be argued as a natural process? Aging is natural, right? I mean, it, it's something which which is supposed to happen, as opposed to addressing a disease, which is not something which everyone gets at, at the same rate. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I tend to not try to get hung up in those terms because just because 100% of the people age, I mean, how much different is that than 33% of the people getting cancer? I, you know, I, I joke with people that if, if everybody got cancer and only 33% of the people age, we'd have 10 times as much money to do research on aging. Uh, and and uh, I, I think it is about education. I think it's about saying to, to everyone that... Um, 
and and not just the public. I think a, 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 you know a lot of uh, scientists and MDs don't think along this route either. That really this is uh, you know you don't get these diseases until you get old. There's got to be a reason for that. <laughs> and it's and when crazy. we when we go in with animal models and we slow aging, they're resistant to the disease. And so I, I, you know, I think that the evidence is really accumulating that, that this is possible. You know, I, I don't want to be someone who's out there saying that uh, we're going to make people immortal. I don't think this hard. The science supports that concept right now, but I think the science does support the idea that if we can do uh, in humans, what we can do in animals, you can extend 10 or 15% the health span of, of of humans and if you did You're being that conservative that's a, aren't you the 10 15 percent that's a more profound effect on society than curing all cancer than people over 50 because it's, think about it if you cured all cancer uh in in people over 50 you only have about a three and a half per year extension of lifespan and the reason for that is that two-thirds of the people don't die from cancer in the first place. And the third that do, they have other, uh, uh, they're unhealthy in other ways, and they might live 10 years longer, but they're going to die from something else. And so a 10 or 15% extension of health span and lifespan would, would cause about a 10 to 15-year extension and it would, in their functional period where people can, is, can act. Is and that so conservative? I, I, Are you being conservative with 10 15%? I'm going based on what can be done with pharmaceutical compounds in mice and what the data today. is starting to today. Uh, so in the future, I think we can do better than that. But I, 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 I get scared about going out there and saying we're going to have huge impacts on lifespan because we can't support that with the hard data right now. And we don't have to. Well, the point I'm trying to make is the economic and social impact of just 10 or 15 percent, 10 or 15 more years of healthy lifespan is bigger than the impact of, of curing these diseases. So uh, I don't. I think what we need to do is is convince people that what what we're saying is based on hard science and that we believe we can do something. Would it be true to say that you know the NIH, which is National Institute of Health, <laughs> right, that this yeah. is health related research rather than disease related research? Is it shouldn't be? Should it be? We're studying the effect of these genes on health and disease with putting a little bit more emphasis on, on the health side, right? If Sounds you take great. a look at, 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 oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, if you've got one out of five dying of heart disease, number one killer, mm. no, one, one out of seven dying of cancer, one out of 20 dying from stroke, right? Um, and you're putting most of your budget in those three prongs, but what is the chances of dying? One in one, right? Yeah. So it's death and taxes. So, you know, I guess it would take some time to, uh, to for some of the data to really be realized, uh, you know, and acknowledged, um, and those benefits in those animals seen out in the wild before the NIH will shift some of their efforts away from things that are are, are true kill, well killers and you know causing a generation yeah. of people dying prematurely. I totally agree with you. I think we need to be thinking a lot more about health and not only in the context of aging research, but in other kinds of preventative medicine as well. But uh, I think that, you know, the NIH doesn't exactly turn on a dime. <laughs> you know, yeah. it it, uh, it takes a long time for ideas to percolate and cause big change. And I think that's why, you know, we want to take the message of the people. You know, I think people can understand this. I don't think it's a, a detailed technological argument we're making here. I think it's a well-supported, simple common sense argument. And once people understand it, they go from saying, ah, why do I want to live longer to, yeah, I think that's a great idea. And so, um, uh, you know, we want to get the message out to uh, uh, everyone and, and have a common, you know, uh, swelling of interest in this type of research. And I think that might be the way to evoke change. Be, we'd have to take one uh, short, quick break here again. Um, and then we'll, we'll continue the discussion uh, with uh, Brian Kennedy. Uh, president of the Buck Institute, President and CEO of the Buck Institute for Age uh, Research. And we, uh, we also have Simon Malav here as an associate professor uh, at the Institute. Um, I, I'd like to thank, take a minute, another minute <laughs> to thank Mailroot for sponsoring this episode of uh, Futures in Biotech. That's Mailroot. That's a new sponsor. Uh, businesses of every size uh, use Mailroot. One user, 50,000 users, it doesn't matter. Mailroot will protect you from spam and viruses, simplify your life, and make your email usable again. Uh, Mailroot is a secure, 
hosted service that filters virus and spam for companies of any size. Whether you're a single user or a company with tens of thousands of employees, MailRoot can eliminate viruses, spam, reduce the load of your email server, lower your costs, and make your email usable again. Typical root, uh, typical mail root customers see a 95% reduction in their inbound email volume and virtually no false positives. I mean, I, we, we can't get that in science. Um, <laughs> Mr. Laporte, Leo Laporte, our uh, chief twit, uh, loves MailRoot. He's been using the service for his domains for more than six years, and MailRoot has been his top choice for spam and virus filtering all along. So I guess I guess I use MailRoot as well. I didn't know, but I, uh, you know, uh, thanks, Leo, for uh, keeping that uh, email load down. Tom Johnson, the founder of CEO of uh, the founder and CEO of MailRoot, started. Uh, one of the very first companies in this market back in 1988, it was called FrontBridge. And Fr FrontBridge was acquired by Microsoft in 2005 and is still offered as the Microsoft Exchange hosted services line. Tom wasn't done. He had too many good ideas that he couldn't stand to see go to waste. <laughs> so he started MailRoot, his next generation uh, service for filtering email with a level of accuracy and a price that's unmatchable. There's no nothing easier than filtering mail uh, with uh, MailRoot. There's no hardware or software to install. You just sign up with MailRoot. Then you, uh, you change the MX records for your domain to start mail flowing through them, and then they do all the work for you. Uh, visit MailRoot.info to sign up. As a Twit listener, you'll receive a 10% discount for life, for the life of your account. Small businesses start at $2 per user per month for 10 users. And because of the demand of the Twit Army, MailRoot has added a new service for individual users as well. So uh, $30 per user per year for single user. So you want to get rid of spam uh, and, and um, viruses, $30 a year and you're done. Visit MailRoot.info and sign up with the email filtering service. And uh, Tom Merritt uses it as, as, uses it as well. So uh, uh, and and Leo does too. So I, I'd recommend you give it a try. Um, you can sign up for a 50 day, 15 day free trial and you get 10% discount for life. We thank them for sponsoring uh, Futures in Biotech. All right, so uh, we're back with um, Dr. Brian Kennedy uh, from the Buck Institute. Um, now it's the Buck Institute for Aging Research. Yeah, the title is yeah. Age Research, but yeah, what we're really into is uh, uh, understanding the basic processes that drive aging and trying to figure out ways to do something about it. But it's, it's, a, it's a nice compilation of scientists that we have several people that work on basic aging. That's what I do. Uh, but we also have experts in different diseases of aging, like Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, people working on uh, diabetes and cardiovascular disease. And so you can have this synergy that works between people studying the diseases of aging and, the, and the, how that interfaces with the basic biology of aging. Um, and uh, go ahead. Yeah, Brian, I was just going to say, uh, I mean, you sort of we've we've had a fairly wide-ranging conversation over a, over a number of areas, um, and, but but you touched on on rapamycin and, and you mentioned Tor once, and uh, mm -hmm. I know you'd you'd like to talk about Tor more. So <laughs> why, why don't you why don't you give a little overview of of what you think about the role of Tor is in in aging at, at this point? Not to put you on the spot, but it's a uh, it is a fascinating and and rapidly evolving uh, concept in aging research at this point in time. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, so the work that we did in, in yeast and worms pointed us to this TOR pathway. And another scientist, Pankaj Kapahi, here at the Buck Institute, and before that he was uh, at Caltech, he had figured out that TOR was affecting aging in flies. And, and uh, those studies and a few others po really pointed to the notion that this is a central pathway that might affect aging. And so what it is, is a, it's a protein kinase. So it f regulates the activity of other proteins. It phosphorylates them. Uh, and it responds to uh, the level of nutrients in the environment. And so it's long been known that this process called calorie restriction extends lifespan, and that works in uh, a whole range of different organisms. Uh, and one of the things that calorie restriction does is it turns down the activity of this kinase. And we think that's one of the key factors that mediates the effects of calorie restriction. And then when TOR activity is 
high and, and when there's lots of nutrients around, uh, it drives cells to, and organisms to grow and uh, uh, develop rapidly to reproduce offspring rapidly. It's good evolutionarily because you you know pass the germline on very quickly when Tor activity is high. But it's probably bad for the somatic cells in your body because you're not being careful and taking care of the damage it's accumulating. So when you have dietary restriction or calorie restriction and lower the nutrients, you turn down Tor. And that makes you, uh, if you're if you're still in the process of development, it's slower. Uh, onset of reproduction is slower. But if you're an adult already, and, and it it doesn't have those impacts. And what it does is it tells your cells to turn on maintenance mode to to be more uh, resistant to the types of damage it's accumulating. And we think that's uh, the reason that when you turn down the activity of this kinase, it makes animals live longer. Uh, and now since the rapamycin study I told you about works in a mice, there's very good evidence that, that turning down TOR extends lifespan in yeast, worms, flies, and mice. And I think that's really the only pathway where you can say that about. So we're excited about it. And much of my lab is trying to understand in more detail what the mechanisms are by which TOR regulates aging and uh, to develop other uh, therapeutic interventions that um, might uh, give you uh, similar or even greater benefits to than rapamycin and maybe without some of the potential side effects. So uh, it's become a very exciting field. Uh, there are many, many labs that are now working on TOR and aging, and uh, I think there's a, a good reason to, to pay attention to it. One quick question as an entrepreneur here. <laughs> Have you started a company, <laughs> or are are you gonna, are you working through the model of licensing uh, your research through uh, the Buck Institute? Well, uh, uh, the Please licensing I've done is later. I've just moved Sorry. to the Buck five months ago. The licensing I have done is to the University of Washington, but that's the route we're taking. We had the okay. opportunity to start a company, and we we decided that it wasn't the best way to go forward. And and you know, really, what I care about is understanding aging and and doing something about it. And the, the question is, where is the right place for me to be to best mm -hmm. make that happen? And I thought that this opportunity at the Buck Institute was a gave me a, a far greater capacity to help the cause than trying to start my own company and um, taking that route. But there are sure. people, uh, private interests that are involved in looking at some of these other compounds that inhibit TOR signaling. So um, I'm sure that people will take up the the cause in, in terms of developing reagents from that perspective as well. Well, you, you want to see your, your research translated and sometimes, uh, you know, you, you, that need becomes so strong that you take the entrepreneurial route. But if you can be very, very productive at uncovering some of the, the fundamental biology that will translate uh, and that there's enough uh, people out there that uh, can carry it from the point where you've brought it up to this great level, uh, then it, you know you can be sure that it'll get done. You just, it's, it's kind of a hard decision that I, I try to I, I kind of ponder on all the time. Should what's the best way to translate and actually get stuff to clinic? Yeah, and we, I like we, the idea. Go ahead, Simon. I, I was just going to say, uh, as a field, there, there have been uh, a, a number of forays into this area, and as you mentioned earlier, the the most successful uh, in one sense was is the uh, is the Sertris example. But that that approach has has happened. Um, several times before, not a huge amount, because uh, aging research is still comparatively new in terms of, of something, d developing a drug for, for some aspect of, of the pathophysiology of aging. But there have been at least two other fairly prominent companies, one of which is still still around, is uh, is Geron is still around. That was actually founded quite a long time ago to, to great uh, media hoopla when it when it originally uh, incorporated uh, in the Bay Area uh, a number of years ago, oh over ten years ago now I think, and that that was sort of founded on the idea of uh, uh, retarding uh, telomerase and and uh, and essentially monkeying around with the telomeres to extend lifespan. That didn't happen, didn't pan out, but they they ended up becoming a, a company primarily focused on on cancer. So so there have been examples of people moving from academia into sort of the entrepreneurial um, area and uh, putatively developing an approach to forestall aging. Uh, it's just that nothing tangible has come from that yet. But when it does, it, I, I'm sure it's going to be big. 
Yeah, and I think there's lots of different routes for interaction now. The, the lines are getting more blurred. You're starting to see pharmaceutical companies contract research into academic institutions because they, you know, they feel like that in many cases it's the academic researchers doing the basic science that uh, is, is a better route to get to that first stage where you can start to think about intervention. So um, there, there are lots of ways to stay in an academic environment and still have uh, the capacity to affect development of, of of therapeutic agents. And so I, I think that uh, everyone has to make their own decision. I, I'm certainly, uh, I, I like the idea of people becoming entrepreneurial when the time is right, but it, it's not always clear when that time is. Uh, Geron's a good example of that. It's still, I think, very possible that you could alter uh, telomerase activity and affect longevity. There's data from uh, uh, Maria Blasco and others that have come out that have suggested that, but I think their timing was wrong. Uh, and so now that there's a lot more known, there might be uh, more uh, advanced ways to intervene and do something there. Uh, so when you start a company, you're really making not only the, bat, the, the, the pathway you're studying is the right one, but that you can make things happen in a very limited time frame. And uh, you know, it, 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 it's not always clear that, that that's a that's a high risk thing. Um, one other thing uh, we might want to talk about a little bit, Brian, is I mean, you mentioned you just came to the Buck Institute uh, five months ago. Uh, the the Buck people may not know listening is is one of a few research centers in in the the country which is focused on aging and age related disease. It's a comparatively new type of enterprise, uh, something which th there has been some call for over the last uh, 20 years or so, but there have been very few places where there have been a collection of researchers who are focused you know, primarily with a, with a view to the biology of aging, but also trying to understand the nexus between diseases of aging and, and the biology of aging. And that, that's, a, that's a pretty interesting um, uh, contemporary concept in science, is this idea that there is a, an intersection between these two areas. Yeah, I, 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 it's something that I've been saying for a long time, and I, I really love the idea. I think the research here at the Buck is great, and that's why I came here. I mean, ultimately, what I care about most is doing the best science I can do, and I'm not going to go anywhere where I can't do that. So the focus here is very unique, I think. It's centered exactly on the idea of understanding the aging, the, the, how aging contributes to disease and what we can do about it. And so I think there's really almost a unique opportunity here um, to take this route and see it through. And that, that's what made me want to come here. Uh, and it's also a platform by which I can help get this message out. Uh, because I think if we do that, we'll not only help the Buck Institute, but help the, the, the aging research community in general. Um, yeah, I think if you could, you know, put five or 10 times as much resources into aging research as we have now, you'd be stunned at how fast the progress is because the ideas are good right now. The limitation is the resources and that, you know, that we want to uh, do everything we can to increase the resources available here at the Buck Institute. But I think that you can make that claim uh, really anywhere where aging research is going on right now. You, you know, one thing I, when I talk to students, I try to tell them that, you know, there's uh, how many, six billion people. Uh, a third yeah. of that are in the top end of the generation or the top generation. Okay, so there's about three generations per for every human, there's roughly three generations. So we're looking at 2 billion people, right? And out of those 2 billion people, with those stats that I mentioned before with, you know, cancer, stroke, uh, heart disease, cancer, and stroke, um, if they can improve the quality of life for those 2 billion people by extending the health period of their, of their life, right? Not just extending life, but just, just the health, you're going to be saving... Um, what so one out of five, one out of seven, one out of twenty. Add those together, um, basically one out of four, a quarter of them. So about five hundred million people from premature death. Think about that. And it, so it's not just those diseases too. I mean, you just you you picked uh, fractions of uh, onset of well, three different diseases, but there are well, a ton of age-related diseases. I mean, most of the diseases people get have some aging component to them. So. Um, you're really talking yeah, about a majority a, of people. That's a crude stat that we that we have the yeah. number for. And, and you're right, the age-relating diseases, I mean, but your angle is not to 
really tackle age-related diseases, but to use that as a platform for FDA approval of the molecules that you develop towards the pathways that you develop for. That, that, that's, that's a, a that's strategy. A our, our angle is to tackle all the age-related diseases at the same time by going after right. the main cause, aging itself. The St. Peter, the gatekeeper, the one right at the, at the heart <laughs> of it, right? Aging. Yeah. And, and so do you feel uh, like you're under pressure trying to save 500 million people from premature death? <laughs> Sorry to put it this I way, but thought of it that way. Usually, uh, my 99-year-old grandmother tells me that I better get, you know, th that I need to work 24 hours a day at this point. So uh, uh, she puts enough pressure on me alone without thinking about the other uh, 500 million. <laughs> well, I, I'm certainly glad, and I bet you do. I bet you were working. <laughs> You've got this institute uh, with a lot of great, great people. Uh, so we're gonna do. Uh, a few in, uh, interviews with uh, some of your, um, your your faculty, and um, it's going to be a great exploration of this new field and this uh, groundbreaking area uh, that's going to change humanity. I, I, I can't I can't but see that these 500 million people dying prematurely might benefit from a nutraceutical. Right? Do you see it going the nutraceutical route? I, th I think it could, and uh, you know, resveratrol that people talk about—that's a, a natural product, and so it, um, it doesn't need clinical approval. There, it's a big market now. People going out and uh, buying and taking resveratrol. We don't know whether it's going to help or not, uh, and I, I don't take it myself. But uh, you know, I think that that's certainly one route around this FDA approval process is to find some compound that. And it's can, in red wine. Don't forget to mention that. It's in red wine. The only problem is you have to drink about 50 bottles a day to get as much as they're giving the mice. So, uh, but it will extend money? your lifespan if you drink 50 bottles a day. Yeah, and, and actually to, sit, to, 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 to extend on that, ethanol consumption has is, is long been thought to be good for lifespan. Uh, so a modest amount of drinking is probably um, not, if anything, good for longevity as long as you don't uh, go overboard and to damage your liver too too much. So, so uh, you know, I think what, there's a lot of thought that wine is good for you. I, I don't think it's the resveratrol component of the wine because it's too small, but it could be a lot of compounds together um, that are acting in the wine. You know, I, I, I didn't mean to sort of ask the question in that the nutraceutical, something that could bypass the FDA approval and the scientific method to allow us to get access to uh, compounds that would extend lifespan. I meant once the FDA, FDA demonstrates, I mean, the science demonstrates, demonstrates that in age-related diseases, I mean, you know, they, they're, they're delayed people. And what happens, okay, these people were taking it to delay the onset of Alzheimer's and now they're living healthy to 120. What do you do with that data, right? So now you've got a situation where the lucky people that were on the clinical trial um, got to live longer, then you take it to the next step. Okay, do you make this an FDA approved drug for age relating disease? Or if the data is so compelling that even in a conservative 15% increase in lifespan, don't you make it, uh, it's an FDA approved drug, but don't you extend it? it? Does it become like marijuana and like legalizing marijuana? Why should it be only the people that um, yeah, I, I think the, that once you show efficacy, there'll be a public demand to, to do something to make this work. So it's unclear how that's going to go forward. And there are a lot of there are meetings where people gather and talk about how to, to solve this problem. And I don't think we know all the answers yet. But once you start to see things beginning to work, um, I think they'll end up being, if you build it, you know, they will come is my view on this. <laughs> this is a huge arc for humanity. I mean, what about countries that can't afford it? Where it the cost of the drug it, is a dollar a day, with some people, that's what they need to eat. Yeah, those, that's a problem with every uh, pharmaceutical agent that gets developed. There's always uh, a difficulty of delivering it to people that can't afford it. And uh, I, I don't want to minimize that problem because it's a huge problem. Uh, and if something gets developed here, it'll go through the same route. But uh, uh, Those are for the uh, sick people, though, at the moment. Now you're looking at a nutraceutical that could affect the life of every individual of that country. You'd be well, but, committing you know, an entire country a, to premature deaths. A good example is HIV. You know, a big percentage of the population in some of these African countries have HIV. They're not sick yet, but they carry the virus. Now, you know, this is a, a real success story of medical research. It's turned uh, AIDS in from a 
uh, always lethal disease to a chronic treatable disease, but it's expensive to do it. And you've got huge segments of the population who are still healthy, uh, but they're infected. And if you could give them this treatment, they would live longer. And how do you get an expensive drug to 20% of a country is, is, you know, this is aging itself would be 100 percent but uh um, what i'm saying is that people are having to think about these problems already and and one one final example on 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 that line is uh let's not forget about immunizations uh, as a historical uh fact i mean basically there's no more smallpox (laughs) right so at some at some point in time smallpox was affecting large swathes of the world and and now it's gone People don't take vaccines for the influenza. They're scared of uh, influenza. And I've kind of promoted the vaccine whenever I get a chance. I say, hey, you know, it's, it's still time, by the way. It is still flu season. So I would uh-huh. go out there, go to your local pharmacy. It's free. You get an influenza shot and your likelihood of contracting the disease have greatly, greatly diminished. But will it kill you, the disease? No. It'll make you awfully sick for a week. And not only that, it's going to make other people sick when you give it to them. And then if you just so happen to have somebody in your family with an immune issue, it could kill them. And it'll, it can kill the young and it can, you know, can kill the old folk from secondary infection. Yeah. So should you get vaccinated? Yes. Will people do it? Not necessarily. So I guess if you make this drug available, some people might think, well, this is Big Brother trying to force us to take a pill. Yeah, I mean, I, I just want to emphasize that point that uh, especially in uh, older individuals, they're very susceptible to serious uh, viruses like this. And so uh, you can say it won't kill you, but it actually will lead to secondary infections, as you said, especially in the, the aged population. So I think it's really urgent to go out and uh, take advantage of these opportunities to, to, to keep yourself uh, from getting these, these viral infections. But, but I guess here, here's the situation. We can all we all think that we can survive the flu, so we don't get the vaccine. Well, I I always get it because I don't have a week to take off. But most of us that don't take it, or those people that don't take it, don't take it because they think they can survive. But I guess they they nobody will ever believe that they can cheat death without any kind of <laughs> biotech engineering behind it, right? Um, yeah, it's it. I, I'm not saying that it's not going to be a challenge, but I I think that uh, again, it's a matter of doing enough experiments, enough different kinds of animals and starting to do experiments in humans and showing that they work, uh, people will come on board. <laughs> and maybe not everybody, but I, I'm, not, I'm not saying it should be a mandatory drug. I think that if, if you get the word out and people think they can live healthier for another 10 years by taking something, there are going to be a lot of people that want to do that. Well, imagine if you could just put it into red wine or create a plant that could, <laughs> could produce it, put it into red wine where you'd only need to drink a glass a day. And then you'd benefit from the wine and from the uh, from the, uh, the the vitamin. I would I would call it a vitamin at that point. I'll, I'll uh, get on that right away. <laughs> <laughs> There's a formulation, right? Sometimes you have to deal with proper formulations. Hey, you know, I, I think we've you've set a fantastic uh, groundwork here uh, for the future shows on um, on this topic that we're gonna we're gonna cover in January. So we're probably gonna do one in January and uh, probably another one in February. And, um, it, of course, people that want to listen back, they can listen to episode two of Futures in Biotech. And I think it was episode 36. Now, I'm not 100% sure. I don't remember every episode uh, number. But uh, we, we interviewed um, Cynthia Kenyon. Um, and uh, she, she does the work on worms. It, it, she's, just, she's just fantastic. Uh, lastly, we, we interviewed um, Aubrey de Grey, who uh, may be listening. Um, it was kind of a, an interesting show because he's not really a biologist, but he's a theoretical uh, biologist. What, do you mind if I ask you what are your thoughts on his quest for uh, eternal life? Well, you know, I, I, again, I think that um, th- his thinking process is very similar in that, uh, that this is a route to make people healthier and longer. Um, I, I would disagree with him in the sense that uh, trying to convince people now that they're they're going to have negligible senescence and be immortal is I, I I think in some t- some ways that's counterproductive because it makes it sound like science fiction. I can't prove that if we did everything that he suggests doing, we wouldn't be immortal. I don't know, but we just don't have the data to support that right now. And so what I think the difference between uh, the message that he's trying to tell people and what we're trying to tell people is that you know we're basing. Uh, uh, 
our approach on hard data um, and our goals for what we can do for humans on hard data and animal models and that uh, we don't want to we, we hope we could do better, but we don't want to uh, make promises like that that aren't supported by the data. And so I can't promise you that if we put uh, resources into our approach that we're going to extend health span by 10 or 15 percent or even more. But I believe we can, and I've devoted my career to it. And so that's what I want to see happen. I think his uh, goals are a bit higher than that, and uh, um, we'll have to wait and, uh, until a lot more research comes in to see whether those are feasible or not. Well, you're not a theoretical biologist, so uh, you're an actual scientist uh, at the bench, uh, in the lab, um, working on data. So I, I don't want to raise his premises and his uh, uh, goals uh, to make it impossible, for, you know, to, to, to relate. To, you know, I, I don't want to relate his work to yours. Uh, I mean, he's more of a sci-fi. I mean, he's, he is funding some research and getting people excited about it. But really, um, I respect... Uh, the work that you guys are doing at the, the Buck Institute. And I encourage people to go to the, uh, the buckinstitute.org and find out more about your work. Um, it is, it's going to change the world. So uh, I'd really like to thank you for coming on. Oh, on it's been show. fun. Anytime. Anytime. So that, our, that was our guest, uh, Dr. Brian Kennedy, and he's the president and CEO of the Buck Institute for Age Research. Um, as I said, you can visit his, uh, they have a website, it's www.buckinstitute.org, that's B-U-C-K, institute.org. Uh, thanks again for coming on. This is great. Um, I'd also like to thank um, our co-host, Simon Melov, uh, Melov, sorry. <laughs> just it's, it's just Melov, it's really not <laughs> French, honestly. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll have plenty of time to practice over the next coming, uh, the next two shows. Um, Simon is an associate professor at the Buck Institute for Age Research, and he was uh, key in putting uh, this show together. Um, so thank you very much for, uh, for getting this going. Sure, no problem. Um, I'd also like to thank um, uh, your communications director. Um, I, I can't pronounce her last name. It's Chris. Chris Rebelo. Rebel Rebelo. Rebelo. <laughs> thank you, Chris, for uh, helping getting this going. You made uh, organizing it uh, very easy. Well, actually, you organized it, so I really appreciate that. Um, that was is super. So, um, also like to thank Burke McQuinn, who's handling the audio and video boards and recordings today. Thanks, Burke, for. Uh, for keeping the questions coming. Um, I'd also like to thank the team that make this possible, Leo Laporte, Lisa Kenzel, Frédéric Louis, Eileen Rivera, Ken Kep uh, Shepardson, Tony Wang, Mike Taylor, John Slanina, uh, Jeff Stewart, Jason Howell, and uh, the rest of the team in Petaluma, California. I'm gonna have to update that list. There's been so many people uh, coming on board in Petaluma and they make uh, my job easy. Uh, so thank you, thank you guys. Lastly, I'd like to thank Phil Pelsey and Will Hall for the opening and closing themes. Uh, any comments or suggestions, uh, you can reach me at mark, M-A-R-C, at twit.tv. Um, fortunately, I'm using the, uh, the mail route <laughs> spam filter, so that will allow me to make sure that uh, only real emails get through. So mark, M-A-R-C, at twit.tv, or uh, on Twitter at, uh, at Mark Pelletier, M-A-R-C-P-E-L-L-E-T-I-E-R. For Futures in Biotech, I'm Mark Peltier.